Hey, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church. I'm Cody, I'm one of the pastors here. And before anything else, uh, we need you to hear this, that we're a no matter church. And what that means is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or even what's been done to you, uh, we need you to know God loves you. We love you uh, and you can look for him here with us. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to clean yourself up. Uh, we're just really glad that you're here with us today. 
And if you are new, or even newer and you just haven't become known, you haven't gotten connected, um, I'd love to connect with you <laughs> and hear your story, uh, get to know you and send you an Amazon gift card for taking that step here today. So if you fill out our welcome card, it takes only 30 seconds to do so. Um, I'll get you an Amazon gift card sent here today. And all you need to do is text NEW to 99581. It's gonna send you a link to the form and you fill that out, I'll get you an Amazon gift card today. And I'm not gonna spam you with texts or follow up emails. I just wanna reach out and connect with you and see how I can be praying. For you and the next step that we talk about every single week is giving generously and when you give to prairie lakes church you do a couple of things you partner with us in changing lives here in iowa and beyond and there's just something that happens when we are generous with our finances because uh, if you're like me uh, finances are one of the biggest competitors for your heart your attention your time and when you're generous when you give that away um, you give God more room to work. You put him back on the throne of the heart where he belongs. So if you give, uh, or you can give right now um, online by going to prayerlakes.org forward slash give, and you can select your campus from the drop down. But we are going to continue in our first and second Timothy series. So let's kick to Pastor Chip. Hey everybody, welcome to Prairie Lakes Church this weekend, no matter what campus you're joining us from. Welcome, we're glad that you're here. And I just want to say, hey, good job prioritizing church <laughs> this week. Because listen, I know uh, we're right in the middle of like weddings, grad parties, end of year school stuff. The weather is finally nicer outside. So there's a million things you could be doing and uh, you're a part of Prairie Lakes Church right now. So good job. Uh, God honors that obedience and wants to speak to you today. All right, let's dive right in. This is week three in the final week of a series called Lessons from First and Second Timothy, where we're talking about what matters to God and what should matter to followers of Jesus. And First and Second Timothy are two letters written by a guy named Paul, an evangelist and church planner, to a young pastor named Timothy, probably around in mid-60s AD, somewhere in that time frame. And uh, like a wise old sage passing on spirit-infused wisdom and battle wounds, Paul gives this young pastor clarity on how to lead the church and some amazing truths to follow, uh, to live and, and love and obey Jesus more. So here's what we've been in this series so far. Uh, week one, Pastor John kicked us off by talking about your doctrine matters, how what we believe informs how we live, what we do. Last week, Pastor Jesse said your leadership matters. We had 10 principles that he laid out for us from First and Second Timothy. And this week, we're going to talk about how your character matters. Your character matters. And so as we start this weekend, I'm going to answer three really important questions about character. Before we dive into the Bible, I'm going to level set and talk about what character is because I think it's really important that we know what it is and what Paul's describing when he talks about Christian character in these two letters. Now, character is an interesting word. Uh, we use it in lots of different ways. We say things like that person is a shady character or they have bad character or I have character flaws, or we say things at work or in school like this, character counts. But what is character? Right? Even as parents, we're like, hey, I want my kid to have good character and integrity. I want them to marry people of good character. I want their friends to be people of good character. What does character mean? Here's what character means. Character is a part of your identity. It's a group of traits or qualities about you that are true most of the time. Okay, So it doesn't have to be true about you all the time, but most of the time. And character is one of the driving forces behind our words and our actions. Character motivates why we do what we do. So character is a group of traits that are true about us most of the time that comp uh, comprises part of our identity. We can say that person is honest, or that person has integrity, or that person is kind or loving or courageous. That's a part of their character. It's a part of who they are. Or we can say that person is deceitful, lazy, untrustworthy, or greedy. But understand this, as a Christian, identity and character are both ends. Here's what I mean by that. For the Christian, character is only a part of our identity. Because for all of us who step over the faith line and trust in Jesus, we're called holy and blameless in Ephesians 1.4. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are new creation, new creatures in God's sight, that the old is gone, that the new has come. 
Romans 6, 11 says that we're alive in Christ. And Paul, in a lot of his letters, he calls Christians, he calls us saints. That you may not feel like a saint, but you are one. Because in Christ, when you step over the faith line, your identity in Christ, your security in him is fixed forever. Your identity there does not change. You're a child of God, and all the wonderful things the Bible says about you are always true of you, and, and the rest of our lives is spent growing together in Christ's likeness and growing in character. So we are, have a fixed identity in Christ and the rest of our lives is growing in a Christ-like character with Jesus. That's the beautiful thing about the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ is this. Your character can change and grow. That it's not just you're born with a certain type of character and you just live that way the rest of your life. Character, because of the good news of Jesus and the transformational power of the Holy Spirit in our lives means that we can grow and change. That's the good news of the gospel. In fact, the entire life of a Christian, once you step over the faith line, is a journey of becoming more like Jesus and your character being more like Christ's. So for the Christian, your identity is fixed in Christ and your character should grow to look more like Jesus over time. It's a both and for followers of Jesus. So the second question is this, how do we grow in character? How do we grow in character? Um, I call growing in Christian character for the follower of Jesus, becoming who you are. It's the process of growing up and becoming more like Jesus. And I would say this about growing in character. Growing character is closing the gap between what you believe or you profess to believe and how you actually live. It's closing the gap between who you are and who Jesus is. This is what it means to grow in character, that you close gaps in your life between what you say you believe and how you live and between who you are and who Jesus is. The fancy theological term for this is sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus. And here's what I mean. For instance, we may say, hey, I believe that God is generous and God's going to take care of me financially, but yet we're not generous to people around us. There's a gap between what we say we believe and how we live. We may say, hey, I believe kindness matters. We should treat all people with respect regardless of what they believe, but then we could gossip about them. We could say, hey, I believe that forgiveness of enemies and those that hurt you is crucial to the follower of Jesus and yet not extend forgiveness. Those are gaps in our character between what we profess to believe and how we live, between who we are and who Jesus is. And the, the growth in character as a follower of Jesus is always closing those gaps when they appear in our lives. Now, the last question I want to answer uh, this weekend as we start is this. Why does character matter for the Christian? Like, why are we spending a whole week talking about this? Why did Paul feel impressed to write about character to Timothy 2,000 years ago? Here's why. Our personal obedience to Jesus and holiness matters. That your relationship with Jesus, your becoming more like him, matters to God and it matters to the people around you. That, that faith in Jesus is not just, hey, I step over the faith line, I got my gold ticket to heaven, and I'm just going to coast all the way into eternity. That is not what Jesus died for. Jesus died for you to be conformed into his image, to look more like him. In fact, the journey of a Christian is one of confession and repentance, of dying to self and living for him. And that matters to God. But it's not just about our journey for ourselves. The second reason why character matters is our collective witness as the church to the watching world matters. Our witness as individuals and as the church together to a world that needs to know who Jesus is absolutely matters. The world is watching you and the world is watching us to see if Jesus is real. To see if he makes any difference in our behavior, in our lives, if what we profess to be true is what we actually do. In fact, one of the primary criticisms of a non-Christian world to the church is this. You know, what a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> There's always a scandal, right? This church is falling apart and they're blowing up and they're dividing. This pastor's falling into this sin and can't lead anymore. And There's all these different things that people say about the church. Some of it's fair and some of it's not. But the point is this. The world is watching to see if you believe what you say you believe. The world is watching the church to see if we will reflect Jesus or not. And when we do, it is so powerful. And when we don't, the people in our little Iowa's, they kind of shrug their shoulders and go, yeah, told you so, right? Bunch of hypocrites. There's a lot at stake when it comes to our character and becoming more like Jesus. So here's what I want you to do right now. I'll just grab your Bible if you got one. Open it to 1 Timothy chapter 2. If you got your phone, grab that. Grab your Bible app, whichever one you use. 
and navigate to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to put the words on the screen as well. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at three lessons about character from 1 Timothy. Just 1 Timothy. So we're not going to dive into 2 Timothy today. We're going to dive, dive only into 1 Timothy. And I'm going to give you three zingers. Paul's got these zingers that he gives to Timothy about character that are really powerful for us today. And so I want you to turn to, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. And here's the first one we're going to look at. Here's what Paul says. He says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Paul doesn't say pray for each other and pray for the church. He includes that under the umbrella of all people, but he specifically says pray for kings, people in authority, people in power over you. Why, 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 why? Because, because... The point here is, is that we should pray for those in power and those in authority over us so that we can live out our faith, so that God blesses us and so that the people around us can see that we live differently. And here's a convicting question for you today. Do you pray for those across the political aisle from you? Because that's what Paul's saying. We're supposed to do that. Because we want to be a witness to the people around us. We want to be a witness to the people that don't know God, that he's real. Verse 3 says this, This is good. And pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Again, what's the point of all the praying and blessing those around us, those in authority, so that we can live peaceful, quiet lives? Well, it's so that people will be drawn to Jesus and come to faith in Him. So the Christians might be seen in a positive light. And here's what Paul describes next about this good news in verse 5. He says, For there's one God... And one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I'm not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Now, in verse 6, there's a word in there, uh, the word witness. It's the Greek word marturion. And it means to testify or give evidence of something. Another way we might describe that word is to say we're going to give proof of something. Paul is saying here something's happened that's powerful that everybody needs to know about. And what it is is that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That He's our mediator between God and us. Jesus Christ is. That there is good news to tell. That we should live our lives in such a way that our lives demonstrate the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the point that he's trying to make is that there's good news to share. So Timothy... Timothy, I'm going to give you instructions for men and women now on how they should live. And here's what Paul says in verse 8. He says, Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Now listen, I'm not sure if you know about men or not, but we are a strange group of people. <laughs> Dudes have three primary emotions, okay? The primary emotions, the trinity of emotions that men feel are hungry, angry, and numb. You ask a guy, hey, what do you feel? I'm just kind of frustrated and angry right now. Or you ask a guy, how do you feel? I'm hungry. Or you ask a guy, how do you feel? And he's like, I have no idea how I feel right now. It's one of those three, okay? That's what men feel. And men can fight about anything. The dumbest stuff we fight about. It's crazy. Ford versus Dodge versus Chevy. Real tree versus mossy oak. Cardinals versus Cubs, Packers versus all the other inferior NFL franchises out there, right? We fight about anything. But here's Paul's point. Paul's like, I don't want men to quarrel. I don't want their posture to be fisticuffs like this. I want men's posture to be raising up holy hands and praying. I want that to be the impression that people get about men in the church. Now, because Paul is an equal opportunity offender. He talks about women next and what they should and shouldn't be doing. He says in verse 9, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Now, I want to be careful with this one because it's a little bit delicate. Because most women care for and invest deeply in their appearance. And it's certainly not wrong to take care of yourself and look good. That's not a bad thing. It's good to take care of your appearance. It's just not good to make your physical appearance the priority of your life and draw unnecessary attention to yourself or parts of your body by how you dress or how you look. Uh, any man knows this reality to be true. You go on a date with a woman, here's the deal. It takes you 10 minutes, men, 
to shower, put on your favorite pair of jeans, and get out the door. It takes your date just a little bit longer to get ready. And every man fears this question, the most unfair question that women ask men. You ready? How do I look? Oh, there is no right answer to that question. It's like that dude on Star Wars is like, it's a trap. Every time a woman asks that question, here's what you do. You're like, I don't know what to say. Because if you say great, you're saying it just to make her feel good. If you say anything other than great, you should duck and order flowers right away. Okay, there is no right answer to that question. But the point that Paul's trying to make is this. Women should be known more for your good deeds and how you look. The modesty should be a goal. Not trying to hide your beauty, not trying to make your beauty the focus of your lives and not drawing attention to yourselves or your physical beauty. Now, certainly you can flip the script, right? There's a lot of dudes I know that care way too much about their appearance. I've seen dudes wear tight shirts they shouldn't wear, okay? And I know that women can also be quarrelsome and gossipy and catty and fight. But what Paul's doing is he's playing to stereotypes. And he's saying that what's most visible about us are usually these things, which leads to character lesson number one that I want to highlight this weekend. Character lesson number one is this. The first impression that your life gives to the world about Jesus and about Christians matters and reveals your character. The first impression that your life gives to the world about Jesus and Christians reveals your character and it absolutely matters. If someone right now were to describe your character in a few words, what are the few words they would say? The answer to that question really matters. Is your life a witness to Jesus? Is the first impression people have of you one that you would want them to have of Jesus and the church? See, Paul's character point here is that the first impression people have about you as a follower of Jesus should not be competitive, angry, quarrelsome, immodest, or drawing unnecessary attention to yourself. The first impression that people get about you should be prayer, good deeds, and concern for others first. Because as Christians, we've got good news to share. And that good news that we have to share should not get muddled or interrupted by a bad witness and bad character that we describe or show to the world. The first impression people have about you matters because often it's one of the first impressions they'll have about Jesus or the church. That's character lesson number one. Here's the second scripture I want to look at in the second lesson. It's 1 Timothy chapter 5. So just flip over a few pages if you're there. We're going to look at verse 24 and 25. And there's this short but profound passage, two verses, that outlines an incredible truth that I want you to see. 1 Timothy 5, 24 through 25 says this, The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. What is Paul saying here? Well, Paul's saying this, some of our sins and our character gaps are public, embarrassing, and obvious. They make the news. Other people see them and hear them. When, when marriages break down and the reasons are public, when someone's caught in the act of a lie or cheating in a business deal in real time and it's discovered, that is public and real and it, it's out in front of people. Other sins or gaps in our character are only known right now to God and to you. But you know they exist. God knows they exist. That secret sin of yours, the secret addiction, the inappropriate texting or app chatting you do with someone who's not your spouse, how resentful you feel inside to somebody, even though you're fake and nice to their face, how you feel about them inside, those types of character gaps often get revealed down the road. They stay hidden for a while. And the point that Paul's trying to make here is that you really don't get away with anything in the end that it will eventually get exposed in this life or in final judgment. Either way, God sees the good and the bad, the public and the private. It'll all come out eventually, so don't ignore your character. Don't sweep it under the rug. This is character lesson number two that I want you to see here. Your character gaps will be exposed. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And when they are, don't hide or pretend. Own it and surrender to Jesus in order to close the gap. When your gaps are exposed in your character, when it becomes public or just when you know it privately, don't sweep it under the rug. Acknowledge it, call it what it is, and let God into it. Surrender it to Jesus and be transformed. Because the opposite is also true. 
Doing good deeds out of the goodness of your heart and the good character inside of you will not be hidden forever. Even if the world doesn't see the good that you do, even if nobody knows how generous you really are, God sees and God rewards. So don't give up and don't quit. But when the character gaps in our lives are exposed by God, whether it's publicly or privately, let God guide you to repentance. When you see those gaps, let that be an invitation to be more Christ-like in your character and your witness to the world. Here's why this matters. When we see character gaps in our lives, whether they're public or private, our, our initial response often is to hide, to cover, and make excuses. That is not helpful. Instead, we should own it and grow and let the Holy Spirit guide you and grow you. Now, here's an example of this from my own life that is really embarrassing, okay? So uh, this was a massive character gap that was about four or five different character items that I was poor in, visible in my life at the same time. So fall of 1998, I'm a sophomore at Hastings College, and I'd stepped over the faith line about a year earlier, and I was a part of a select group of people on the campus of Hastings College called the PR Council. Now, the PR Council, we wore blue blazers with a cool little patch on it, and we toured around prospective college students, you know, high school seniors, and their parents. So I got to be like the face of Hastings College. And I got to do this. It was an awesome honor. It was really cool. And uh, in this, sep this September day, beginning of the year, Michelle, the student, student leader for PR Council, sent around an anonymous survey to all the people in PR Council, faculty and, and, and uh, uh, student leaders, and said, give anonymous feedback. And she was going to forward it on to people. So I thought, okay, cool, anonymous feedback. Now, here's what you need to know about me. Um, I have a strong sense of justice. Uh, on the Myers-Briggs, the J part, I'm like 99% J. I can be very black and white. And I can go from frustrated to resentful in about 3.2 seconds when things aren't going smooth or right. I've got a very strong sense of things should be working optimally all the time. And when they're not, I have strong feelings about that, okay? So I get this email from Michelle and I'm like, oh, pff, anonymous survey? This is awesome. So I typed and I typed and I typed and then I pressed send without looking at who I was sending it to. And guess what I did? I sent it to everybody on the distribution list. Not just Michelle, every other PR council member, every faculty representative of the PR council, personal attacks, criticism, all kinds of frustration, it flowed out of me and everybody saw it and I didn't even know it until the next morning. I got a call at eight o'clock to come to Mike's office. Mike was the faculty leader of the PR council. Here's what he did. He sat me down and I thought I was getting an assignment like, where's the family I'm supposed to meet and take on a tour? And he's like, hey, sit down. He had all of my feedback printed off, <laughs> pages. He highlighted the really good parts and he put it in front of me and he said, hey, what of these things do you believe to be true? And I felt like I was this tall. I wanted to crawl under the desk. And after 30 seconds, I embarrassingly said, all of this is what I wrote. And I, I guess I kind of believe all this stuff is true. And he called me out. He said, this is poor character. This is not good leadership. And he knew I was a Christian and he, he appealed to my Christian faith. And in that moment, this character gap was exposed in my life that I was a coward, that I was a gossip, that I had a critical spirit, that I wasn't willing to say things to people's faces and I was just going to hide behind a keyboard. And by God's grace, I was allowed to stay as a member of the PR council. But I just got to tell you what, 25 years later, <laughs> I flinch every time I send an email to more than one person. Like I double check and triple check because of that moment. But, but listen, I've got a ton of stories like that and chances are you've got a lot of stories like that as well. But here's what I need you to know. My friends, you can pretend <laughs> with others. You can lie to yourself and hide who you really are, but in the end, it all gets exposed. You will be found out good and bad. You can't outrun who you really are, and you certainly can't outrun God. So when character gaps are revealed, stop running, stop denying, stop hiding. When they are exposed by God's grace, become more Christ-like. It's God's gift to you to mold you and shape you into who God wants you to be. Don't resist those times. Don't hide. Don't pretend. Don't explain away. Use those as opportunities to grow and be more like Jesus. Now, here's the last lesson that we're going to look at in 1 Timothy 6. So just flip over a page, 1 Timothy 6. I know last time I preached, I highlighted this passage, but I'm going to come back to it because it's really, really important. The last character lesson here, Timothy says this, or Paul says this to Timothy. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. He says, if you want to have a lot in life, here's what you do. 
Work on your character. Become more Christ-like in your character and be content with what you have and you'll have it all. For we brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Paul says, be content with your daily bread. Wealth is so fleeting. Pursue godliness and contentment. Focus on becoming more Christ-like in your character, not your bank account or your possessions. I could say it this way. Paul says, hey, Tim, your character matters more than your bottom line. Your character matters more than your bottom line. And then he continues in verse 9. He says, for those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and in many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul says, hey, Tim, young pastor, you need to know this. Money has a powerful pull on people's hearts. It can easily lead to compromising our character with money and possessions. It can be easy to be impressed with the, the money and the possessions of others more than their character. And loving money and pursuing that first and not Jesus will lead to a whole host of problems. And it's caused people to wander from the faith. So, so Tim, Tim, don't walk down that road and lead your people to not walk down that road either. Here's character lesson number three I want you to see today. Our relationship with money is a character mirror. It gives us insight into our character and is a reflection of our character to the world. This is really important. Don't miss this. Our relationship with money is a character mirror. It gives us insight into our own character and it reflects our character to the world. Now listen, money is not evil. Money in our world is necessary. It's neutral. And like many things in our world, it's not whether you have a lot of money or possessions. It's whether your money and possessions have you. Whether money rules your heart or Jesus does. Because our relationship with money is a mirror into our own character and a projection of it to other people. So, are you drowning in debt right now? If so, what does that say about your character or what you love or what you're pursuing? Are you saying the wrong yeses in your life so that you don't have time for family and, and time for your church family? Are you a generous person or a generous family? Do you give to God and others to the point of needing to adjust your own lifestyle or... Or is all that God gives you spent on you and your own lifestyle? See, the answers to those questions reveals your true character. Not what we say we value, not what we want to value, but what we actually value. When your little Iowa holds up the mirror to your life and how you manage money and possessions, what do they see? Do they see a refreshing picture of someone who is focused on being content with what they have and pursuing Christ's likeness and, and being generous or... Do they see something else? Paul says to Tim, hey, buddy, um, life is not found in the abundance of your possessions or money, but it's pursuing godliness and Christ-like character and being content with what you have because money is a mirror into our character and a projection of our character to the people around us. It absolutely matters. That's number three. My friends, First and Second Timothy are so rich. There's so many different things I could have drawn out in these two books. So if you haven't read these two letters yet, do it. It's not going to take a long time. But there's so many things about character that you'll see popping out of the pages of these two letters. But character matters because your personal obedience and holiness matters. And our witness as a church collectively to the world around us, your little Iowa needs to see Christ-like character from you and from this church. And when you see gaps in your character between who you are and who you want to be, between who you are and who Jesus is, it's an invitation from the Holy Spirit to pay attention and to invite God in and to repent and to surrender and say, I'm going to close that gap with God's help. I want to be more like Jesus in who I am. And I'm going to close this way. Closing the gap in your character is not about doing better and trying harder. It's not about just working really, really hard to be a better person. And listen, I'm going to speak to a couple different groups of people right now as I close. I know some of you listening right now, you're not a follower of Jesus right now. You're checking Jesus out. Maybe you grew up in the church, but you've never stepped over the faith line. You've not trusted in Jesus. And right now, here's what you're doing. You're working really, really hard to be a good person. And you're failing. And you're really frustrated. And the reason why is that you're trying to be like Jesus without a relationship with Him. And that is impossible. You, you simply can't do it. Hebrews 
11, 6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without the power of Jesus in your life, you cannot become more like him. You cannot close those character gaps in your life on your own strength and power. You need to confess, repent, trust in him and find life. Others of you right now, you've trusted in Jesus. You stepped over the faith line, but, but here's your deal. You're on the sidelines of faith. You, you see gaps in your character and you just kind of ignore them. You see sins in your life and you kind of tuck them under the rug and go, oh, there's always going to be sin. God's grace covers it. Like, I know I'm saved. It's not a big deal. And you're just kind of coasting into eternity on the sidelines of faith. And if you're in that spot, I want to challenge you this weekend to get off the sidelines, get back in the game of faith. Jesus died for way more than you just to coast in a comfortable life into eternity. He wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to work on those gaps of character in your life to grow to be more like Jesus. That's the point of faith. There's others of you right now that are listening and you're like, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus and I am exhausted because it feels like I play whack-a-mole with all the character gaps in my life. You know that game whack-a-mole where you smack the mole and then like three more pop up? Some of you right now are you're just like, hey, I feel like I've got these gaps as a parent. I've got these gaps as a friend. I've got gaps of integrity as a worker at my workplace. And I just feel like I hit one of them and three more pop up and I'm so tired of fighting. I'm so tired of trying to just do better. And I'm so tired of like God pointing out all my flaws. Listen, if you're in that spot today, first of all, I absolutely understand it because I'm wired that way. But if you're in that spot today, here's what you need to remember. You're not supposed to be perfect. <laughs> only only God is, only Jesus was, and he's perfect for you. And you need to know today that shame will never motivate you to change. But grace will. Be motivated by God's grace to change. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and I'll give you rest. Jesus says, come to me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And maybe today you just need to be reminded that, hey, God knows, God understands, he sees your effort. He sees your heart. He knows you're trying. He knows that, that you're seeking Him and you're pursuing Him. And just remember God's grace. And if you're in that spot today, I want to encourage you to rest and remember it's grace that fuels change, not shame, not even guilt. It's God's grace and His love that should be fueling your change. So rest in that. Surrender whatever weight you feel to Him. And just remember that Jesus knows and that God's got you no matter what. Hey, no matter what spot you're in this weekend, um, the solution is all the same. It's surrender to Jesus. It's confess when those gaps appear. Surrender them to God and let his power empower the way that you change and that you grow because your character matters. Let's pray together uh, right now as we close. God, all of us are in different spots in this faith journey, yet your invitation to all of us is the same. You want us to surrender to you to see the character gaps in our lives and by your grace and through your spirit to confess and repent and to grow more like you. For those, God, today listening that need to step over the faith line and trust in you, God, give them the courage to take that step. For those that need to get off the sideline and quit coasting in their faith, God, would you convict them to pursue you more wholeheartedly? And for those who are tired and weary of the fight, God, give them rest and give them grace today. God, help us to reflect more of your character to the world, our little Iowa, God, that desperately needs to see who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Chip. A uh, great way to conclude our lessons from First and Second Timothy series. Uh, and next week, we're going to start a new series called Reassembly Required. So excited to have you back for that. Uh, but maybe today, uh, during the message, you have something that's convicting to you, uh, that you want to process with someone, or, or maybe you're just carrying something today that you could use some prayer or someone to talk to. Uh, we would love to be there for you. Uh, so in this moment, uh, right now, we have people ready to do that. So if you're in church online, you can hit the live prayer button. Uh, if you're on our social media, you can send us a message, and we would love to be there for you. We'd love to pray with you here today. But kids, uh, you are up next. Children's ministry is about ready to begin. Everyone else, we hope to see you back for our new Reassembly Required series next week.
You're my calm in the chaos My peace in the world You speak light into darkness You tell me I'm yours Only you, Jesus, are in control You are my every heartbeat Every breath that I breathe You're all Welcome to Story Lab. This week, we're talking about confidence while we take a look at the story of someone who had big questions. Hey, do you know what the best kind of armor to stop a piglin attack is? Hey, I'm Skylar. And I'm Sebastian. We're talking about confidence, which is living like you believe God is with you. What are we doing today? What do you think we should do? What about raising our game? Where should we start? How about at the beginning? Why don't you take the lead? Why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> okay, stop. Too many questions. Except you can never have too many questions. Which is exactly where we're going today. Right. So what should you do with a question? Depends on your question. Point taken. Okay, so we're entering s'more season. Mmm, mm. s'mores. s'mores. But you don't always have a campfire when the s'mores cravings hit. So I'm thinking maybe we could put a marshmallow in the microwave. Please form that phrase as a question, Sebastian. Um, what happens when you put a marshmallow in a microwave? Yes. Well done. You have just initiated... The scientific method. The what? The scientific method. It's a great way to figure out how things work. Step one, ask a question. Already done. What happens when you put a marshmallow in the microwave? Step two, make a hypothesis. I've always thought a hypothesis sounds like a mythical creature. Duck! <laughs> a hypothesis is a prediction you make based on what you've seen before. Well, a bonfire makes a marshmallow soft and mushy, so I think a microwave will make it melty. Kinda. Step three, conduct an experiment. Wait, is this the part where we put the marshmallow in the microwave? You bet. Yes, let's, let's do it. it. That is a serious marshmallow. Well, this is serious business. Ready? Ready. Commence experimentation. 
Whoa, it's puffing up. Yeah, it is. A lot. Wow. It's still puffing up. This is pretty wild. I wonder how big it's gonna get. Look how big it's getting. Oh, I can smell it. Step four, analyze your results. Wow, it looks like our marshmallow turned into the Hulk for a minute. It did get melty. Mmm, <laughs> that's perfect. Step five, draw conclusions. I conclude putting a marshmallow in the microwave is super fun and perfect for s'mores. So there's your answer. Asking questions is super fun. Speaking of which, it's time for... The story before the story. Today, we're in the book of Acts, which tells the story of the early church. But before Acts, way back in the very beginning, out of a deep, deep love, God made an amazing world. But when people turned away from God, the world was broken. God made a plan to draw people back into relationship. So at the right time, God sent Jesus, God's very own son, to live among us. Jesus gave up his life. Then on the third day, he rose again. After Jesus returned to heaven, the early church grew quickly with the help of God's spirit. When the believers faced trouble in Jerusalem, they scattered to other places, taking the news of Jesus everywhere they went. Which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Jen. Just as the religious leaders in Jerusalem hadn't understood Jesus, they also felt threatened by his followers. Many of Jesus' friends were thrown in prison. Some were even killed. But that didn't stop the new believers. They moved out from the city into Judea and Samaria. One believer, a man named Philip, began teaching about Jesus in a city in Samaria. Big crowds gathered to listen. Sick people healed through God's Spirit, and many people became believers and were baptized. There was great joy in the city, but right in the middle of this amazing work, God sent an angel to speak to Philip. Go south to the desert road. To the desert? The road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. If I was Philip, I would have been full of questions. I mean, things were going great in Samaria. Lots of people were becoming Jesus followers. So why would God want Philip to leave it all and head for the desert? I mean, the desert. There's no one here. But Philip listened to God. He started off down the lonely road into the desert. And before long, he spotted something. As Philip drew closer, he saw an Ethiopian official seated in a chariot. God's spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot. Stay near it. Now the man in the chariot happened to be very important. In fact, he was the royal treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia. Though he was not Jewish, he believed in the one true God and had even journeyed all the way to Jerusalem to worship God there. But though the man had loved God, he was missing a big piece of the story. As the official traveled home, he puzzled over some verses in the book of Isaiah, the prophet. He was led like a sheep to be killed. He did not open his mouth? <laughs> Excuse me. Stop the chariot. Uh, just uh, wanted to ask. Uh, do you uh, understand what you're reading? How can I? I need someone to explain it to me. The Ethiopian man invited Philip to join him in the chariot and explain the scripture. How amazing is that? I mean, you can see God at work in every detail of this story. Here, uh, read this again. He was led like a sheep to be killed. Just as lambs are silent while their wool is being cut off, he did not open his mouth. When he was treated badly, he was refused a fair trial. Who can say anything about his children? His life was cut off from the earth. Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? I am so glad you asked. What a perfect setup. Philip was able to explain that the prophet Isaiah was talking about a savior and that this savior had come. Philip shared the whole story of Jesus, 
how he lived, how he gave up his life for us, and how God raised him back to life. The Ethiopian official was mesmerized. He took every word to heart. As they traveled down the road, the man looked up and saw a pool of water shimmering in the distance. <laughs> Look, here is water. What can stop me from being baptized? Just a quick reminder, they're in the middle of a desert, which generally means no water. <laughs> and yet, miraculously, God brings them to an oasis at the perfect moment. Philip baptized the Ethiopian in the pool of water. It was a sign that the man now believed in and was choosing to follow Jesus. As the two men came up out of the water, God's spirit suddenly whisked Philip away. The Ethiopian official must have understood that God was at work because he continued on his journey back towards Ethiopia, filled with joy. The end. Wait, what happened to Philip? Great question. We have no idea how or why God's spirit moved him, but Philip next showed up in the coastal town of Azotus. He immediately began to tell everyone there the good news about Jesus. I love how when the Ethiopian man had big questions, God set up an amazing way for him to learn about Jesus. So, what's our part in the story? Well, just like the Ethiopian man, God welcomes our questions. When we're confused or uncertain about something, we don't need to hide it, whether it's a big question about God or a little question about a homework assignment. We can ask. You may be wondering, why is it so hard to do the right thing? God does let bad stuff happen. What do I do when my parents argue a lot? Will I be able to make friends at my new school? Why do I have to work harder than everyone else just to do okay on a test? You can take all of your questions straight to God or to a parent or a teacher or another trusted adult. Now, if you need help with the homework assignment, your teacher can definitely give you an answer. But you might not get your answers to your other questions, at least not right away. And that's okay, because no matter how many questions you have, or no matter how big they are, God won't get angry or annoyed with you asking. You can be confident that God will be there, right there with you, no matter what. No question about it. That's right. See you next time. So here's the thing. God is with you, even when you have questions. I have a question. Can I make two marshmallow peeps joust in the microwave? Only one way to find out. Thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. See, See you, you next time. time.